Well, ladies and gentlemen, for those in the room and for those online, uh, welcome back from after lunch. It's my great privilege to introduce the Honourable Kevin Rudd, the Australian Ambassador to the United States. Uh, Kevin Rudd is Australia's Ambassador and has been here since March 2023. Uh, he also served as Australia's 26th Prime Minister from 27 to 2010, then as Minister for Foreign Affairs before his second term as Prime Minister in 2013. Since leaving government, Ambassador Rudd has resided mostly in the US, where he's recognised as the leading analyst on China, and in 2015 he became the inaugural president of the Asia Society Policy Institute in New York. In 2020, he was appointed president and CEO of the Asia Society globally, and in 22, he founded the Asia Society's Policy Institute Centre for China Analysis. Ambassador Rudd graduated with honours in Asian studies from the Australian National University and received his PhD from Oxford in 2022. He also studied at the National Taiwan Normal University in Taipei. Ladies and gents, it's my great privilege to introduce our ambassador, uh, Kevin Rudd. Thank you. Hello, everybody. This is the most wild microphone I've had for quite a while. Yeah, I like when they introduce you as uh, the leading authority on China. Uh, that is an invitation to peril, in my experience. Just say, you could describe me as an analyst of China, among many as we seek to peer through a glass dimly to understand uh, what is happening within the Middle Kingdom and how it affects the rest of us as well. And um, thank you for the kind invitation uh, to be here and to share some reflections on where AUKUS is up to, where it fits within the uh, geopolitical environment in which uh, we, the United States and the United Kingdom find ourselves in, both with the Indo-Pacific and more broadly. Uh, and f beyond that, uh, where we see the implementation of AUKUS now standing in terms of the submarine program, but also what it seeks to do more broadly in opening up what in reality can become a, uh, an effective free trade agreement between the three countries in defence, science, technology and industry, which if taken seriously is quite transformative for all of our uh, industries. Uh, 15 September marks the uh, third anniversary of uh, AUKUS's original announcement. And so uh, we've moved from infancy to near infancy. Uh, three years uh, is not a lot of time, but in those three years, a lot has been achieved. Um, it has been an interesting journey in terms of turning concept into policy, into legislation, into regulation, and now into execution. Uh, so for those of us who've been part of this particular pilgrimage, uh, I thank you at whichever level uh, that you have contributed here in the room. Australia's uh, long-term national security uh, interests are driven by a concept, a clear concept of deterrence. Uh, deterrence uh, in terms of how we best avoid war, how we best preserve the peace, and beyond that, uh, recognising fully how difficult and dangerous the current international strategic environment is. In recent times, I've spoken at length about how we define integrated deterrence, what does it mean within the United States? What does it mean between the United States and allies? I've also sought to understand and speak on most recently at the National War College last week in the Cannon Lecture on Chinese concepts of deterrence and therefore what are we seeking to therefore engage in the Chinese geostrategic mind? Remember, deterrence, if it is to be effective, must work within the mindset of those whom you are seeking to deter. And unless you have this, the sound of two hands clapping, uh, then there is no deterrence. Um, within that um, frame, it's important that we all recognise how much China under Xi Jinping's leadership has changed the nature of the international strategic environment. When we look at China, we see a state now in active pursuit of the resolution of at least five sets of unresolved territorial disputes with its neighbours. Uh, with India, less known with Korea, more known with Japan and in um, Senkaku Diaoyudao in the East China Sea. Most prominently known, of course, uh, with Taiwan itself, though, of course, uh, within the frame of the One China policy, that would be argued as being an internal matter. 
But beyond that, again, the South China Sea, which involves unresolved maritime boundary disputes with at least four other countries in Southeast Asia. This is a large number of unresolved territorial disputes where China's predisposition under Xi Jinping, unlike under Deng Xiaoping, has not been to consign these matters to future wiser generations of leaders, but instead to seek to resolve them by changing material circumstances on the ground in the here and now. It is also for those of you who study uh, military deployments carefully, uh, a period of parallel uh, strategic uh, change in basic uh, markers like the order of battle, uh, which is um, supported by the United States and by China. In the period since 2010, if you look at the number of Chinese combatant vessels, for example, surface and subsurface, it has risen from just north of 200 to approaching 400. Um, uh, when you look at the United States, um, it has, um, in as of 2010, had something like 280, 290 uh, combatants. That figure is now somewhere between 290 and 300. In other words, the dynamic of change when it comes to the geopolitical environment is clear, as demonstrated by a simple numeric, uh, numerical calculus of what is being deployed into the battle space. And that is simply within one domain, that is the naval domain, before we add other uh, elements uh, to the equation in terms of air, land, as well as cyber and space. Uh, again, uh, around the uh, deterrence equation, we see China's operationalization of its grey zone strategy in relation to Taiwan. We see a similar grey zone strategy now at work in its strategy towards disputed uh, territorial claims uh, in uh, the South China Sea, or as described in Manila, the West Philippine Sea. In Australia, uh, we are de deeply mindful, therefore, of what is occurring uh, across the Indo-Pacific region, uh, what is happening in terms of the large-scale addition to mil military capabilities within the region, led predominantly by China, rising and continuing uh, unresolved geopolitical and territorial tensions, and therefore, the continued risk of crisis, conflict or war. In response to this complex and ever-challenging uh, strategic environment, Australia released its Defence Strategic Review, known in the Australian parlance as the DSR, in 2023. We Australians invent an acronym for everything uh, because we don't like long words. DSR, Defence Strategic Review. The DSR emphasised the importance of asymmetrical capability as a means of deterrence by denial. These capabilities are designed to change a potential adversary's decision-making calculus. And to do this, Australia must harness all elements of national power to protect our strategic interests. This is the DSR's concept of national defence, bringing the whole country together and bringing all levels of national power to bear. National defence is intended as a coordinated whole-of-government, whole-of-nation approach that harnesses all arms of Australia's national power to defend Australia and to advance our interests. It works alongside other elements of Australian statecraft, including industry resilience, domestic resilience, supply chain resilience, social cohesion, innovation, science and technology, workforce skills and the workforce base, and a robust Australian national intelligence community and an active activist foreign policy. Our strategy for achieving all these initiatives, as I said before, is through what we define as a strategy of denial. What does that mean in practice? It involves deterring an adversary by ensuring that the costs of their actions far outweigh the benefits. We seek to deter any state from using coercion or aggression to pursue its interests in our wider region. Ultimately, we seek an environment where no actor considers that the benefits of conflict outweigh the costs. And to achieve this strategy of denial, defence needs asymmetric capabilities within Australia. Enter AUKUS. AUKUS is one of the mechanisms for building this asymmetric capability. And as we seek more broadly to give effect to our strategy of denial. 
Our technology and capability cooperation with the United States and the United Kingdom under AUKUS is essential to building the Australian Defence Force's capacity to deliver calibrated power projection across the full spectrum of proportionate response within our region. AUKUS Pillar 1 will deliver conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines for Australia. Those of you who are familiar with this know that this is a pretty important and impressive piece of kit and equipment. Those of you who have seen what a Virginia-class vessel can do will understand that. Those of you who are engaged in the planning uh, or in the participation more broadly in the design of uh, what will be the AUKUS-class submarine to replace the Virginia-class vessels, I believe will be equally impressed. These are designed not as ornaments, they are designed to be a critical element in deterrence, hence their capability structure and hence the decision by Australian governments to proceed in this direction. That is AUKUS Pillar 1. AUKUS Pillar 2 is usually described as advanced capabilities. Uh, with six broad capability areas to begin with. Electronic warfare, quantum technologies, advanced cyber, hypersonics, counter hypersonics, undersea water, uh, warfare, artificial intelligence. These are the areas we consider that will make the greatest impact on the future of warfighting. We must harness, therefore, technological advances that will lead to the development of these asymmetric capabilities and to do so at speed. At present, the amount of time which it takes a piece of technology in the innovation phase to actual deployment in the hands of the warfighter can be up to 12 years. We need in our current strategic environment to get that down to two or three years. That is at least consistent with what our Chinese friends are doing at present. Furthermore, AUKUS builds on our long-standing relationships in the United States and in the United Kingdom, and this will enable deeper collaboration on individual AUKUS projects beyond submarines, including on a range of security and defence capabilities. Through AUKUS, we are building both near and long-term capabilities and expanding our capability options for beyond what we could achieve alone. And for us, that's important. It's also important for the UK, and it's also important for the USA. Although AUKUS Pillar 2 is primarily a technology sharing partnership, it is in fact much more than that. It will enable our militaries, our industries and our economies to work together more seamlessly during a period of deteriorating strategic circumstances in the Indo-Pacific and more broadly. I emphasise again the seamlessness objective here. At present, for those of you engaged in defence industry, you'll be familiar with the morass, the mire, the complex maze, if I can extend the alliteration one step further, the mess uh, that exists in the complex web of uh, ITARs and FMS approvals and their Australian and UK equivalents, no wonder innovation dies at the doorstep. That's why the objective, the policy objective is set by our political leaders has been to create a seamless investment environment across these three industries. Why? Not just because we think it's good for industry, we think it's critical for innovation and it's critical for rapid and timely responses to the deteriorating strategic environment in which we find ourselves. We have created, therefore, this seamless license-free environment for the vast majority of defence trade between our three nations. And we need our defence industry and our academic communities to make full use of this uh, new environment. On AUKUS Pillar uh, one, and that is the submarines component, I should reflect here uh, what progress has been achieved over the last three years. Significant, tangible steps towards implementation uh, have occurred. In December of 23, in a strong bipartisan show of support, the United States Congress passed the 2024 National Defence Authorization Act with substantial enabling provisions for AUKUS, including authorising the transfer of Virginia-class submarines to Australia. This was significant. Those of you who know anything about getting legislation through the United States Congress, United States Senate in this domain, or in any other domain, will know that it's not a cakewalk. Uh, this took a lot of effort, and we're glad to see it done. And we thank our friends on both sides of the aisle for making that possible. Second, Australians are now on placement in shipyards and in education, training, and apprenticeship facilities across the United States and across the United Kingdom. 
Here in the US, the first three Royal Australian Navy officers graduated Submarine Officer Basic Course, SABC, in April this year and have now joined the US Virginia class submarine crews. More than 20 Royal Australian Navy sailors and officers are curr currently training in the US Navy submarine training systems. And over the next 12 months, these numbers will grow from 20 to 100 and beyond, uh, including those serving at sea on US Virginia class subs. In other words, we have got going. The first submarine tendered maintenance period has submarine tendered maintenance period has just concluded in WA, that's Western Australia. In the past couple of weeks, the Royal Australian Navy have had personnel which have directly uh, participated in the maintenance of the US nuclear powered submarine in WA. This is the first time we have done that. Therefore, again, it evidences not just what we're doing at the operational level, what we're doing at the training level, what we're doing at the level of those working in the shipyards as well. Material progress has therefore been evident during the course of 2024, given that the legislation underpinning all this only passed in December of 2023. Then, of relevance to the university sector, the Australian government has announced the establishment of the Nuclear Powered Submarine Student Pathways Program. This is a target national competitive program providing an additional 4,000 government funded places over four years in STEM related courses to grow the skilled workforce required to meet the future demands of the nuclear powered submarine enterprise. On top of that, 3,000 scholarships over six years uh, will be made available to further support the uptake of priority STEM degrees for full time domestic undergraduate students. All AUKUS partners are investing significantly to ensure the success of what we call the optimal pathway. And we are working at a pace to transform and integrate our trilateral industrial bases to support uh, this SSN cooperation. In a time of uh, such geostrategic challenge, AUKUS cooperation is critical to promoting the regional balance and we need to pool resources to combine strengths across our respective sovereign borders. And what about AUKUS Pillar 2 progress so far? Pillar 2 is also accelerating and deepening the development and delivery of advanced military capabilities. The alignment of our national defence strategies anchored by our shared values is facilitating this. Pillar 2 is also providing a vehicle to break down barriers and to improve the broader trilateral trade and innovation system. Specific areas of capability cooperation include what is called the AUKUS Maritime Big Play, uh, where we are developing autonomous systems in the maritime domain through a series of exercises and experiments leveraging our collective industrial bases and innovation sectors. We also see this in the trilateral anti-submarine warfare domain through rolling out advanced AI algorithms on multiple systems, including in P8A maritime patrol aircraft to process data through to improving our anti-submarine warfare capabilities. And a third example of progress to date, quantum positioning, navigation and timing to ensure stealth in the undersea domain. In other words, work is proceeding and work is advancing. We're also driving innovation through the AUKUS Innovation Challenges and enhancing defence trade and industrial based collaboration through historic legislative and regulatory change to enable the development of advanced capabilities. The first AUKUS Innovation Challenge focusing on electronic warfare was launched in March of 24. This was an opportunity for academia and industry to respond directly to government demand signals. We encourage input from universities in responding to future AUKUS innovation challenges. The idea being rather than AUKUS innovation consisting of governments and departments of defense simply saying you shall build X, instead to say to industry, we need capability Y, how would you fill it? That is the essential difference in the space that we are now operating within. August partners are engaging regularly with the university sector whose insights and contributions are critical to delivering these advanced capabilities. In Australia, we've met with some of Australia's universities through the group of eight large universities with large research uh, faculties to understand how we can foster greater economic, uh, academic and economic engagement on pillar two projects. We've also established the Advanced Capabilities Dialogue, a new platform for Australian academia and industry to engage with Pillar 2 through classified and unclassified briefings. Together, 
These activities enhance AUKUS's partners' capability, their collective security and their deterrence. So here we are, three years on. Is it a stellar record of achievement? No. Uh, is it a reasonable record of achievement? Yes, uh, against, frankly, any normal political, public administration and administrative measure. The challenge now is as follows. We spent effectively a year developing the AUKUS policy concept. We spent the second year legislating that concept into legislative reality. This year, we have focused our efforts, which will conclude in about two months' time with the final iteration of the so-called excluded technology list of the United States system, the regulatory system which will underpin this entire arrangement. Our focus now shifts to the implementation of concrete projects. And our job as governments in three capitals, together with industry and together with those of you who support uh, the overarching strategic vision of AUKUS is to drive this towards completing a number of leading projects in the next 12 months so that when we look back in 12 months' time, we can point to projects which have effectively navigated the AUKUS, uh, the new AUKUS legislative and regulatory regime, deploying fully what's available within the various defence industry, innovation and venture capital systems and bringing these technologies to fruition. What I would like to see is us being able to point to a number of done projects. My experience of politics and public administration is success breeds success. And what we need to do now is to identify where the success points are. I'm confident we'll be able to do that. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Ambassador, for uh, your insights and your points. We've got about 10 minutes for questions, so I'll ask the audience to perhaps uh, spend some time considering, and I might ask for a microphone to come down here for the Ambassador to be able to use from his position, if that's okay. Um, just to kick things off, if you don't mind, I might think about um, a quote that was uh, mentioned this morning in reference to AUKUS, and it was described as the highest possible ambition in the shortest possible time. Uh, and thinking about that as a frame of reference, Thank you. Sorry about that. Thinking about that as a frame of reference in the broader discourse of uh, public narrative in some of these projects that are potentially decades in execution, um, do you have any thoughts on how the three countries can best, I guess, bulletproof the narrative about AUKUS across what will be multiple terms of parliament, multiple administrations, so that we can maintain sort of the, you know, the event horizon and the North Star that sees us provide these deterrence capabilities you know, from the middle of the next decade onwards? As I partly um, said in my uh, earlier remarks, um, um, fixing the legislation in all three countries is necessary, otherwise nothing happens. Fixing the regulation in all three countries is necessary, otherwise nothing happens. Um, and then on execution, the simple axiom is uh, success breeds success. So in, in doing the, the, the latter, you can either sit back fold your arms and say, as the combined bureaucratic establishments of three, in country, three countries, our job is done, over to you in industry. Mm. Uh, my experience is that that does not often work. What is therefore required is for uh, those in government who have, as it were, been the midwives of this uh, set of arrangements, is to work actively and collaboratively uh, with uh, defence primes and defence industry to bring real projects into being rapidly. And you don't have to be a road scholar to work out that, uh, frankly, there are a number which are well developed already, where this can be taken to the next stage and taken there rapidly uh, with a hands-on approach from government, uh, from industry, and from our militaries. Um, so as I said in my prepared remarks before, we can uh, create uh, a cornucopia of committees. Uh, we can have a thousand conferences, uh, but unless you actually have your eyes on the end goal, which is two, three, four, or five sets of capabilities, which will significantly alter the battle space for the warfighter and direct all energies at the same, and shall we say break crockery on the way through in order to do it, then we don't demonstrate success. Certainly from the perspective of the Australian government, that's the predisposition is to work actively, proactively with industry to realise those objectives. 
once success is achieved, as I said in my earlier remarks, it does tend to breed success. But we are now at the hump, which is uh, moving from theory to practice. Thank you. Who would like to ask a question? We've got one from Jim Caruso uh, up the back of the room. Hi, Ambassador. This is for your China analyst hat. Have you seen any change in Chinese tactics, trajectory, thinking as a result of AUKUS, Quad, Minilaterals? Is it working so far in deterrence to the best of your guess? Uh, this is me as a, an individual, as it were, China analyst, as opposed to reflecting any formal analytical conclusions on behalf of the Australian government or the intelligence community uh, or the policy community. So it's me reading my own tea leaves, if that's okay. Um, because I do read the Chinese literature. That's kind of what I've been doing for the last 40 years of my life, and probably I should have had a better hobby. Um, but that's kind of what I've been doing. Um, so what have I uh, deduced? From the Chinese literature, I think it is relatively clear that the combination of a series of uh, changing regional geopolitical arrangements um, is having a galvanizing effect within Beijing. What am I referring to? I'm referring to the deepening and broadening pattern of trilateral strategic collaboration between the United States, Japan, and the Republic of Korea. I'm referring to um, the a rebirth of the Australia, sorry, the rebirth of the United States uh, Philippines uh, strategic relationship um, and, um, and associated deployments. I'm referring to the emergence of AUKUS uh, and particularly its relevance to uh, the building and acquisition by Australia of nuclear powered uh, conventionally armed subs, attack class vessels. Uh, I'm referring to the Quad uh, and the fact that you have an upcoming Quad Summit soon again between the heads of government of the United States, Japan, India and Australia. Put all that together, if you're sitting in Beijing uh, and if you are uh, influenced by traditional um, Soviet means of calculating what is arrayed around you, that is around concepts of the correlation of forces, then suddenly the correlation of forces is looking more complex than it used to only five years ago, frankly, because all these things that I've just referred to have really come to fruition if you go through the list within the last three years. Um, so therefore, is it having a deterrent effect? Um, unfortunately, I don't sit in the inner sanctums of the Central Military Commission and I don't have access to um, the recorded minutes of the, of the meeting. Um, but my assessment, that's the best I can say, is that when Chinese military analysts uh, look at the geopolitical picture, they see it more clouded and cluttered than they did before. Uh, what Chinese military planners want throughout history uh, is absolute clarity on where individual components of the strategic picture are and where they will move under a given set of strategic circumstances. What we have done collectively in responding to China being no longer the status quo power, but being the dynamic power that is seeking to change the map, uh, is that these actions have largely been spontaneously combusted from countries across the region and beyond, in the case of the United Kingdom, and have therefore presented a much more complex picture of what I often describe as dynamic deterrence as opposed to static deterrence. Of course, the core of uh, deterrence does not just lie in geopolitical architecture. That is one overarching feature, but anchored in one thing, the United States has a remarkable um, uh, uh, strategic advantage, which is its uh, uh, 43 treaty alliances around the world. Uh, the People's Republic of China has a relationship with North Korea it has a relationship uh, with um, uh, now with Russia and has a relationship with Pakistan. Um, and beyond that, uh, they do not have 
the range of geographies which the United States has within its possession. So I think, um, but within all of that, what the Chinese system spends most of its time looking at is individual weapon systems and whether one is capable of deterring the others, which brings us down to the meat and to potatoes of deterrence as well. Um, but on the broader question you've asked about surrounding architectural changes, I think they are having a cumulative deterrent effect. Thanks, Ambassador. Thanks, Jim. Any other questions? We've got time for one more. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Jack Krapansky, unaffiliated. Um, do you uh, have any uh, concerns about the upcoming elections in the United States, and are you losing any sleep at all, or is it just going to be, do you expect that AUKUS will be uh, supported equally, uh, no matter who wins? I've always been a good sleeper, uh, <laughs> and uh, it goes back to my own time in politics as Prime Minister of Australia. If you don't sleep well, then uh, you're in trouble. Um, so... Um, uh, as my wife says, I could sleep through the blitz. Um, the, uh, secondly, uh, if you've been an ally of the United States, as long as Australia has been an ally of the United States, like, you know, we're, we're beyond, we're about three quarters of a century in this business together. Um, and that's formal alliance structures. Prior to that, we had informal alliance structures during World War II and during World War I. For the better part of a hundred years, we've been in the trenches uh, with our great and powerful friends in the United States, and frankly, over much of that time with the United Kingdom as well. So I think the, the view of Australia is that whatever choice uh, the American people make on the 5th of November is a matter for the American people, and we will work uh, comfortably uh, with the administration that the American people choose. Finally, on the question of AUKUS, uh, I have... Um, uh, no evidence other than what I see through the huge bipartisan turnout in legislation in the Senate, in the House, all stripes of both the Democrat Party and the Republican Party unifying behind the AUKUS legislation. So beyond that, it's pretty hard to, um, to add. So I think um, uh, we'll just leave November 5 to you. And on that note, unfortunately, ladies and gents, we've run out of time. So will you join me and uh, thank Ambassador Rudd for his time today?